Okay, thank you everybody for showing up today. Um, this is part of our speaker series we have every semester where we bring one or two speakers who can talk critically about games and video games and history or some form of historical representation. Uh, we call the series Playing with the Past. Uh, today we have Dr. Ashley Bird. Um, she is a um, Native American game designer. Uh, she has a PhD in Native American studies and the Moreau postdoctoral fellow at the University of Notre Dame. Um, she's gonna present, I think, some research from her dissertation and recent scholarship that addresses representations of Native Americans in video games and analyzes specific colonial methodologies. She's also currently working on a book manuscript tentatively, tentatively titled Red Dead Redemption, Finding My Place in the Digital West, which I think is contracted through the University of Chicago Press, if I'm correct. Um, that looks at the relationships that different players have with games and undertakes an exploration of the Red Dead Redemption series, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, she also, um, whoops, I'm gonna post this again. Um, the, these games here that you can look at that uh, I'm posting again in the chat, um, full of birds and one small step. Um, she has also um, on Twitter, if you wanna find her there, um, her Twitter handle is as for the clouds. And one of the best parts is a post from today. To quote her, she said, best part of class today, getting to refer to John Wayne as a quote, Colossal dirt bag. I did get permission to use that material, um, but I think it is also important and 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 referential to to what uh, she will be potentially talking about today. So it is uh, it is relevant. Um, and at this time, um, as I let people in, unless uh, Professor Smith. Before we get started, today. I'd also like to thank the American Indian Studies thank Program you. on our campus yes. uh, as well for co-sponsoring this talk um, and Dr. Greger for her support of this program, um, as well as thanking the History Department um, for continuing to support our efforts in bringing unique and interesting conversation to the campus um, that is sometimes outside of the traditional realms of historical scholarship and historical study. Um, and would encourage you all to look at both of those programs, um, whether or not to fulfill breadth requirements or to um, you know, engage in a, a, a more diverse conversation about the past and about the world that we're living in right now. So thank you all for attending. Um, I know some of you are my students um, who are here because of points, but hey, um, <clears throat> that's all right. That's at least a half a step of getting you here. So um, welcome all. Um, and I will now hand it over to Dr. Bird. Kitsi Ulioni Umziwi, Kwai Kwai Nirumbak, Ndelwazi Ashley Hope Bird, Nia Pahana Mumbanaki, Nia Odzihila Batawaguk. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, hello, my friends. So good to see you. My name is Ashley Bird. Um, I'm a, an Abenaki woman. I'm originally from the Middle Place or the Champlain Valley of Vermont. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of my research about representation and reclamation at Native Americans in video games. And I will go ahead and share my screen with y'all. So um, one of the first things to kind of talk about when we talk about games, I think is to talk about language. So languages shape how we view and relate to our world. And in al we in the Abenaki language, um, which I just introduced myself in, it emphasizes relationship. So linguists have kind of historically said that our language has animate and inanimate conjugates, but that's not actually correct. Um, it's kind of a misinterpretation. Um, we think everything is alive and has a spirit and um, the conjugations actually refer to relationship. So something with an inanimate conjugation like um, a book, is different than something with an animate conjugation like the sun. The sun exists on its own, does its own thing, can offer things to us. It doesn't need us, it just exists independently of us. Whereas a book, which would have an inanimate conjugation, we need to bring more to that relationship for a book to kind of serve its purpose. A book cannot read itself to us. So we have to bring more to that relationship. So this language outlines relationship, our understanding of our world, our place in it, and our relationship to other things. 
Um, so it's important to look at the language of games and specifically how they shape indigenous peoples in digital spaces and how these languages teach players to view and relate to them in the world of games. So I kind of see games operating in two distinct languages, kind of visual representational language, which is kind of everything on the surface. So dialogue, um, you know, narrative structure, character design, the, the you know, visible environment, all those kinds of things. Um, and then underneath the surface, the mechanical coded language of games, the structure of the game, how it actually operates, which you can and cannot do, which is, I think sometimes to us as players, much less visible. We kind of take it for granted a little bit. Um, and a really good way to exemplify these two distinct languages languages, and kind of talk about the effects of that is to look at this game called The Marriage. So this was made by Rod Humble. It came out in 2006. It was kind of at the like beginning of the art games genre. Um, and when you play this game, you open it and the title screen says The Marriage. And all it consists of is one blue square, one pink square, and um, circles in either green, white, or black. And there's no rules, there's no guides upon starting, there's no sound, no dialogue, nothing. It's really kind of up to you to interpret how you're supposed to play this game. And as you play, you start to see that if the pink square is away from the blue square for too long, goes too long without touching it, it'll start to get smaller and it'll start to fade in color. If the blue square and the pink square touch, the pink square gets bigger and brighter, whereas the blue square gets smaller and starts to fade in color. When the green square hits um, one of the green circles, it gets brighter and bigger. And the black circles negatively affect both of the squares. So I always have my students play this game and I'm like, just play it and then just tell me what it's about. So they play it and after playing this game that has no dialogue, no narrative, no sound, and is just colored shapes, they come away with this narrative that the pink square is the wife, the blue square is the husband, the green circles equal money, and this is a toxic heteronormative relationship where the wife is leeching off of the husband and she's needy, and if she's not with him long enough, she like gets sad and starts to wilt. So they come up with this whole narrative about gender and relationships and money and all of this stuff off of this game that is really, really simple. So these languages are really powerful. This visual language is really powerful, but it's also the mechanics underneath that are reinforcing this language. So for example, if you changed the colors of the squares and they were both blue, one of them is still designated as the female square. So if you look at line 64, female life increase on kiss, it would still grow by a factor of 0.15 and kissing is when they touch. And if you look at line 72, male life increase on kiss, it would still decrease by a negative factor of 0.23. So even if we change the visual language of games, if we're not changing the language underneath the mechanics, it's not always going to achieve the message that we want and vice versa. Sometimes you can change the mechanics and not kind of change what's going on on top and it won't have the effect that you want. Um, I wanna provide a trigger warning for the next slide. It's um, a game that features a rape narrative and it's very difficult to look at, but it's really important because it's the first representation of a Native American in a video game. Um, so this is Custer's Revenge. Um, this game came out for the Atari 2600 in 1982. Um, it was made by a company called Mystique. And if you look at the bottom image here, this is the original packaging for the game. It was released under their Swedish erotica series, which was essentially like adult games. Um, and the packaging markets it as this like sexy Western. So it says, you know, remember revenge is sweet. Every time Custer scores, he comes up smiling and right back for more. The higher the score, the more challenging the game action gets. What the game action actually is, is you playing as General Custer, nude except for a hat and boots, with an erection, and you have to dodge the arrows that are falling from above to make your way across screen to rape this native woman named Revenge who is tied to a cactus. That's the whole game. Just gets harder as you continue to play, like the arrows fall at faster rates and things like that. So immediately, the mechanical and visual language of this game are establishing a narrative of violence against indigenous people in the digital space of video games. It also does this attempt to turn a rape narrative into this quasi-romantic fun quest thing, conflates indigenous women's bodies with the land in a weird way, which kind of has happened throughout history and representations of Native American women. And it also valorizes Custer and the last stand narrative um, and his kind of quest for revenge, which is already a really problematic and highly kind of um, 
fictionalized narrative in American um, history. And in 1983, when the North American video game crash happened, player um, Mystique went under as a company and the, the kind of title for this game was up in the air. So this company called Play Around grabbed it and they re-released the game on a dual cartridge. So they re-released the original version of the game and they titled it Westward Ho, which now applies this like manifest destiny narrative to the to the game but they also made another version of the game called general retreat where all they did was swap the roles of revenge and custer so now you have the same mechanics it's still mechanics of violence you've only changed the visuals so now the native person is in the role of the aggressor and it's still this violent rape narrative um and not only did is that bad enough? But in the early 2000s, um, thank you, the miracle of the internet, someone felt the need to um, reboot this game, which is the top image, completely updated graphics, new mechanics that are much more disgusting and much more violent. Um, there's like a pitting of white women and native women against each other. Um, so not only did this game itself not go away, but these types of visual and mechanical languages of indigenous folks in games continued to perpetuate throughout um, game development. So you have something like the Mortal Kombat series. And this fella on the top here is Nightwolf. Uh, his first appearance was in Mortal Kombat 3 in 1995. He's since then been in 11 of the, I think now 23 installments of this series, which makes him the most prolific Native American video game character of all time. Um, and in the game, he's supposed to be this kind of wise elder. He's always spewing cryptic bits of knowledge, he ends up sacrificing himself at one point to save Earthrealm. So kind of narratively, he's very much a good guy. Um, but mechanically, that does not hold up. Uh, he is hyper violent, just like the rest of the characters. Um, and he also has this fatality, which you can see on the right, called a little off the top, which is a just a euphemism for scalping, wherein he summons a spirit tomahawk, decapitates his opponent, and holds their severed head above him and does like a war whoop. So even if you were to, I mean, his, his outfit like is not, he's supposed to be Apache. His outfit is not like culturally derived in any kind of way. Even if you were to change that, even if you were to incorporate Apache language and you didn't change the mechanics, he's still this hyper violent figure. Um, and like I said, at the end of Mortal Kombat 9, Nightwolf benevolently sacrifices himself to save the people of Earthrealm. And I got really excited because I was like, they get it. It was racist and they got rid of him. And then they made Mortal Kombat X and they made Kotal Kahn, who is somehow worse. Um, he is the character featured below. In the lore of the game, he's supposed to be a Mayan deity. So right away they're fictionalizing the cosmology of an actual group of people um he's also a bad guy um but his outfit and the way he's dressed is actually modeled almost directly off um an aztec eagle warriors outfit so they're also conflating two distinct cultures and groups of people a and again because he's the bad guy he's also hyper violent he has a move called blood offering where he'll cut himself across the chest and he takes a little bit of uh, reduced health, but he has an increase to damage for a short amount of time, playing on the stereotype of Aztec people committing, um, you know, human sacrifice and blood offerings and things like this. Um, he also has a fatality featured on the right called Be Mine, where he rips out his opponent's heart and squeezes the blood all over his face and drinks it and screams. So what this character is telling you is that these two distinct groups of people are the same. Um, their culture is not real. And it also, um, they're also now the bad guys. Um, so this is a really problematic kind of depiction of indigenous peoples in this digital space and fictionalizing real groups of people. Um, then you have something like Assassin's Creed 3, which came out in 2012 from Ubisoft. And this is a really interesting example because this, uh, the protagonist of that game was Connor Kenway. He's half Mohawk and half uh, British. His father is a British Templar, his mother is a Mohawk woman. And he is the first ever Native American protagonist in a AAA video game ever, which wasn't until 2012, which is shocking. Um, Turok doesn't count because those are not AAA video games. Um, so he's interesting because 
these these images on the screen are the collector's edition statues that you get if you buy the collector's edition of the game. Um, and all of the ones on the right are, so there's Edward Kenway, who's a pirate, who's a distant relative of Connor. He's, you know, climbing a mast and there's uh, Bayek holding his eagle and Alexios and Cassandra just doing different like crouching moves and stuff. And these come out before the game even comes out. And then there's Connor, uh, who is bludgeoning a British soldier to death with his tomahawk. This is the first time bef like ever in this whole series, and it's never been done since, that the protagonist has been depicted participating in an act of violence in one of these statues. It's just Connor. They also did it for the cover art of the game, which has never happened before or since. Um, so right away before this game even comes out, he is set apart from the rest of these protagonists as this like savage, hyper-violent native man. Um, and when you play the game, you learn that's not true he's no more violent he's no more predisposed to violence than any of the other protagonists of these games um but even knowing that after the game they still portray him in this way and to exemplify that i want to show you these so video game creators are nerds and they make animated shorts of their characters accepting awards for things um so this is edward kenway connor's distant cousin um accepting an award for the um best action adventure game Gentlemen, as is custom among our kind, we do not idly suffer the judgment of internet scoundrels. But judge us for ourselves and sing our own legends. <laughs> the object of our desire is a VGX trophy, and we want it for the action adventure category and best facial hair if such a class exists. All those in favor of storming VGX and filching that award, shout I! Yeah. We've already won it. We won it? When was this? A couple of seconds ago. Ain't that why we're all here? Jesus, lads, you might have said so earlier. Where's that tuxedo we took? So he gives this rousing speech about how we're going to go and we're going to take the award and whatever. And if he were to do that, like, he's a pirate, so by definition, he's a criminal, so that would not be out of the realm of possibility, but that doesn't happen. They already won the award. He's gonna go put on, he throws down his sword. He's gonna go put on a tuxedo and go to a party. Um, this is Connor's acceptance speech for best character. I am the victor. My heart soars. Thank you. Apprehend that man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a little different. Um, he says thank you and then just absolutely murks a bunch of people for no conceivable reason. And he doesn't even take the award with him. He uses it to bash in someone's head and then leaves. So like I said, even after the game has finished and players know that Connor is not this like hyper violent, savage native man, he's still portrayed this way in a way that the other protagonists are not. Um, uh, race is also really weirdly coded into this game. Um, when you start playing this game, the first couple chapters you play as Haytham, Connor's father, who's a British Templar. And at the beginning of the game, he scales a church with his hands and feet, just like Spider-Man's right up that thing. Um, no problem. And a couple scenes later, he meets Zio uh, on the right. She's a Mohawk woman that's Connor's mother. And he's trying to talk to her and she runs into the woods to escape him. And she climbs up a tree and she's jumping tree branch to tree branch through the forest to get away from him. Haytham can't climb trees because he's white. There's no other reason in this game that he cannot climb trees other than he is a white person. Connor can climb churches and trees because he's mixed race. So in the world of Assassin's Creed 3, white people can't climb trees. There's this racial distinction about what kind of actions people can have. Um, ideas about like consumption and relationship to the land are also coded into this game. Um, on the map, anywhere that's not an established city or Connor's village is referred to as the frontier, which is not how Connor as a native person would have viewed that landscape. Um, 
also there's a mechanic in the game uh this like a skinning mechanic whenever you skin an animal connor will like say a little prayer and stuff and if you don't skin five animals in a row after you kill them you'll get a little message that says connor utilized every animal that he killed or something to that effect and if you do it again after that it'll desynchronize usually if you kind of fail out and to reload into the game and it's trying to kind of convey this like cultural sensitivity of mohawk people used every part of the animal and didn't waste things that's all well and good, but as long as you skin them, you can kill as many animals as you want. There's no kind of repercussions for that. And selling animal pelts is one of the quickest way to earn money in the game. So these colonial kind of capitalist uh, extractive mechanisms are, are put into this game. Um, and that, so all of these games and games like Blood Brothers and the Call of Juarez games, um, bring us to the Red Dead Redemption games. Um, and in this first game in Red Dead Redemption that came out in 2010, I noticed something which I like to call the you assaulted Nastas problem. Um, unfortunately, he is cut out of the image. I did Nastas dirty, I'm so sorry. He's the only native, like prominent native character in this like 42 hour game and he's in the game for like 15 minutes. Um, and he, he's taking you on a mission up into the mountains to help him and so you have to ride your horse all the way up there. So I rode my horse all the way up there and he gets off of his horse and I accidentally bumped into him with my horse and he fell over. He didn't die, he just fell over. Big flash across the screen, critical mission failure, you assaulted Nastas. So they've coded this hair trigger into the game of what you can do to Nastas because of all of these relationships that came before, native people in the space of video games have been the enemy type have been violent, have been someone the protagonist is supposed to fight. And players are going to want to do that when they meet this man. This other man, on the other hand, Nigel West Dickens on the right is a literal snake oil salesman. Um, and he's also kind of a digital stand-in for Frederick Jackson Turner in the middle there, um, who, if you haven't learned about him, is the author of the Turner thesis, which basically says that colonialism is inherent to American identity, that we have to have a frontier to conquer in order to still be Americans. Um, and Nigel West Dickens, even though he's very much a bad guy, there's no hair trigger with him. You can shoot him as much as you want. And not only does nothing happen, you don't get any warnings, he just doesn't die. He's invincible because players haven't been taught to have that type of engagement with him, whereas they have with Nastas. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in a few slides about how that type of preventative coding has also been put in Red Dead 2. Um, but they've done these other things to kind of try to include racial sensitivity and things like that in Red Dead 2. So the first time I was playing this game, if anybody knows anything about these series, people loved the horses in the first game. So they took the horses to the next level in the second game. Um, and you can name your horse. And so I was I'm going to name my horse. I, was like, I don't know what to name this horse. So I was like, I'll name it Roxy, R-O-X-Y, because we used to have a dog named Roxy. Well, I put that in and it comes up profanity text, uh, check. The text you entered contains profanity or unsupported characters. Please try again. I cannot to this day tell you why it did not let me name the horse that. But then I, of course, immediately was like, well, now I have to see what it's going to let me put in. <laughs> um, so like, you can't do like curse words or like drug related words or things like that. So I was like, okay. So like, I wonder what it'll do in terms of uh, race, but I don't want to like put any racial racial slurs in the game. Um, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to use the word gypsy because it has derogatory racial connotations, but it's a very popular pet name. And it said, no, I couldn't do it. So I was like, okay, good job. As you can see from my screenshot, uh, Redskin and Indian are both acceptable names for your horse. So it didn't flag either of those words. So it's it's got this really gray area about who is protected and why and, and what kind of behavior the player should be engaging in. Um, and this happens as well with the protection of the Wapiti people who are the Native American community that's prominently featured in like the latter half, latter third, I would say of the game. Um, and if you look on the map here, the Wapiti reservation has this kind of white outline around it. And what that indicates is that your character in that space is physically unable to draw his weapon. He cannot, like you cannot make him do it in any way. There's only one other area in the game that this happens in and it's a, a town called Rhodes. And there's a narrative reason for that. Your gang's leader asks you not to start any trouble in Rhodes because they're essentially trying to run a con on the town. So he doesn't want you all to be found out. But in any of the other towns in the game, 
you can shoot NPCs to your heart's delight. But all of those towns have NPC law enforcement that will very quickly kind of rain down upon you and make your life very difficult should you continue to do that. Well, PT doesn't have that. So other than instituting something like this, there's nothing to prevent players from going in there. They also don't even have weapons. There's nothing to prevent players from going in there and just massacring them all. And players want to do that. And the evidence is on the left here. So this one poster says, went onto the Wapiti reservation and discovered you can't use weapons. You can't shoot kids either. That's a whole different can of worms that we don't have time to talk about. Um, so are Indians a protected class in this game? Bet Rockstar was terrified the SJWs would they say they supported genocide, all of these things, just mad that you can't massacre these native people, which by the way, the game gives you absolutely no reason to do. It does not tell you that they are bad. It does not tell you that they have something you want. They don't ever engage with you violently. And they're very much out of the way. They are up in the reservation. You have to go to them. So he's upset about that. Um, and then these players provide him with workarounds of how you can get past this mechanic and still kill the Wapiti people for no reason other than games have taught them that Native Americans are the bad guy. Um, this also happened around this game, This Land is My Land, which um, that company has done a lot of not great stuff around this game. A lot of uh, myself and other indigenous designers have reached, reached out to them when this game was in development being like, are you consulting with indigenous peoples? And they gave us a very uh, long thank you, but no, because uh, they just wanted to do what they wanted to do. And they've been known to delete forum posts and tweets of indigenous people speaking out against this game and blocking them from chat groups and stuff. So not great, um, but it's an RPG where you are a Native American man. He is the protagonist. Like you are the, that's the protagonist of the game. It's very open world. This experience the frontier from the other side as if there was one uniform experience of colonization for Native American people. Um, vague narratives about uniting tribes and you're a chief and all that stuff. This is from the Facebook group for the game before it even came out, where again, you're the Native American character and he's the good guy. Uh, this is a fake ass Red Dead Redemption. Spoiler alert, your whole team loses. What if I don't want to be a wagon burner? Can I be a cowboy? Is there a smallpox DLC? Can't wait to scalp women and children. So even in a game where it's telling you this is the character you're playing and he's the good guy, this is people's understanding of indigenous characters in video games. They are inherently the bad guy. Um, and another problem that video games have in relationship to Native Americans is its relationship and construction of land. And specifically the, the connection or lack thereof of indigenous characters to land and the kind of specific reasons for that type of construction. So a good example of this is in Red Dead Redemption 2. The character on the right here is Charles Smith. Um, and he's, other than the Wapiti, he's kind of the main native character. His mom was a native woman. His father was a freedman. Um, and he has all of these kind of stereotypical markers of Indianness. So he always wears his hair in long braids or he wears a scalp lock. Um, he wears different types of regalia and jewelry. He's also kind of the purveyor of knowledge about the natural and he defends the environment. He teaches the main character how to hunt. He also goes on this mission with the main character where they're gonna go hunt buffalo and he gives this whole kind of speech about how the buffalo were so vital to his people's community and they're the givers of life and where we where the buffalo went we went and then he kills some buffalo poachers for just for um killing a bunch of buffalo for no reason uh he also serves as de the de facto go between between the vanderland gang and the wapiti community um so all of this but he complains he he uh, claims to have a complete lack of knowledge of his identity they also completely erase his blackness which is another problem that this game has um he says he doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't know what his tribe is like, even though he says at one point that they lived with his mom until he was like nine. Um, all of the things that he has here, the way that he wears his hair, what jewelry he wears and what's it, what it's made of, what type of animals and landscape he knows about or are related to his people's cosmology, what types of languages he speaks would all be regionally specific. They would all be specific to a specific community in a specific place but he has none of that. And the reason for that is if your friend has a connection to the land that you're just running over, it's gonna make you kind of feel bad about doing that. 
And they don't want players to have to feel bad about that because this is an open world sandbox game where you're supposed to be able to just do what you want. But Land for Indigenous Peoples is so much more than that. It's linked to cosmology, language, identity, responsibility, sovereignty, among so many other things. And Vine Deloria, when he was writing in 1969 about you know, the indigenous um, civil rights movement said that land is an inherent component of Native American people's battle for civil rights. There has to be a land component for that to work. Um, and Mishawana Goman kind of talks about how that land is a physical space, but it can't be limited to that. It, it is a space, but it also gives place. Um, it's an internal and external locus of like understanding for Native American peoples. And that's completely not there in, in video games. Um, so even though in the main narrative of Red Dead 2, the game is kind of telling you, oh, the frontier is closing. America doesn't want people like the Vanderlane gang anymore. There's no place for us to prosper or exist. So narratively, that's what's happening. But the epilogue completely contradicts that because this game is a prequel to the first game. Um, the epilogue literally wipes the Wapiti people off the face of the earth. They are no longer there. And it also completely reopens the frontier. So John Marston gets to settle the West with his little homestead and 20,000 some odd dollars in like 1909. Um, and it's just this free roam and you can just do whatever you want. The landscape is yours now. Um, and this is kind of a form of digital dispossession. Not only do many of the characters in these games have no real world space, they're not connected to a real community in any way, like the Wapiti people are completely fictionalized. Um, Wapiti is a Shawnee word for elk, and the one time you hear them speaking an indigenous language in the game, it's Lakota. So um, they also have no space within the digital realm of the game, like they don't get to have a space. Um, and this dispossession is done to mollify the majority of the player populace who view the earth in games as a consumable object for them. It's not a living meaning making being, um, it's something for them to utilize as a tool, a play thing, a play space. And a lot of these reproductions of these types of stereotype and come down to problems of consumption and, and production. And Anna Anthropy talks about this, that like when you have people who like video games now getting into the video game industry, making the same games for themselves essentially, then you just create this feedback loop of the same types of people making the same types of game for the same audience. Um, and this problematic consumption is like of indig indigenous people specifically is also founded in a lack of education, especially in the United States in regards to native identity and culture, as well as kind of these larger histories of pan-Indianism, commodification and fictionalization of indigenous cultures. Um, so these game companies definitely operate knowing that a majority of their consumers um, are not going to know that a lot of this stuff is wrong um, because they're just simply not educated about it in United States public schools. Um, and even when the representation of racially othered bodies within games happens, a lot of the times it's this quasi escapist form of play for, um, for the majority, not actually by or for the people that are being represented. But indigenous designers are trying to change this. Um, so this is Never Alone, or Kisima Inichuna. It came out in 2014. It was made by Eline Media and um, Upper One Games. Um, and they were commissioned by the Cook Inlet Tribal Council of the Inupiaq community of Alaska to make this game about their, about their community. Um, and it's based on the tale of Kanuk Sayuka, which was first recorded by Robert Nazrup Cleveland. And the whole game is narrated in the Inupiaq language and it has English subtitles. Um, and this, the story is about a young person whose village is being ravaged by a blizzard. And so they go out to try to find the source of the blizzard to help their community. Um, the game, the community made the conscientious decision to have the protagonist be a young girl, whereas traditionally in the story, it's a young boy because they wanted a uh, better representation for Native American women and also better representation for women in video games. Um, and this game really uniquely uses the interspersing of play and documentary style clips to actually engage the player with the culture and how it's being presented in the game. So it, they're called cultural insights and it's the first thing you're actually asked to do when you play. Um, so even the, like using the bola, there's a cultural insight about it. And what is the bola and how do you use it? There's a cultural insight about relationships to the land um, and if you're not paying attention to that, you're not going to be able to traverse some of the puzzles in the game. If you don't pay attention to what way the wind is blowing the snow, 
if it's blowing the wrong way, like you can't make certain jumps and things like that. So all of this is kind of tying in the play and the mechanics of the game to the culture and to the narrative that's being constructed. Uh, then there's Thunderbird Strike. Um, this is Elizabeth LaPensee's game. Um, it's about you play as Thunderbird trying to stop uh, resource extraction on indigenous territories and to protect them. Um, there's two ways to kind of gain points. You can either use Thunderbird's lightning to destroy things like trucks and buildings and pup pipelines and things like that, or you can use it to reinvigorate animals and things that have been killed um, through the resource extraction and doesn't tell you which one you should do. You can make your own choice and you can win either way. Um, so this game is all about environmental protection and the website is really wonderful because it's not just the game. It also teaches you about the story of Thunderbird. It teaches you about pipelines and their history and histories of resource extraction on indigenous lands. And then it gives you places to educate yourself more, to donate, to um, sign petitions about water rights, all of these things. So this game is conveying a message and then providing a call to action. Uh, funnily enough, this game that has the audacity to speak up about um, the environment got Elizabeth LaPense accused of inciting environmental terrorism, which I think is hilarious. Um, this is Hold My Hand by Nathan Paulus Lines. This game is particularly beautiful because we live in a world now with online gaming of a lot of multiplayer games, and I'm sure many of you who've experienced those online spaces know that they can be quite toxic. Um, this is a multiplayer game that is played in person and is about relationship building. So these two little polygonal characters have to hold hands to traverse these puzzles, but this is a two player game. And the way that you play it is on one controller. Each character operates on one half of the controller. So it's like you're actually holding hands to play the game. You have to talk to each other to try to figure out a way to do this in the game. You actually have to form a real life relationship to make the relationship between these two characters work. Um, then there's When Rivers Were Trails, which is taking a lot of the signifiers and mechanics of something familiar like the Oregon Trail and using it to, to tell an indigenous story of an Anishinaabeg person who's removed from their land in the late 1800s and travels across the country to California and they meet, you know, Indian agents and other communities and hunt and fish and gather all along the way. And you make choices and you form relationships and kind of the story that gets told about you after the game is over is contingent on the choices that you made in the game. So it's it's sending this message that, you know, your actions and your relationships matter. They have significance even beyond the space of the game. Um, and then for my own work, I, I make stuff. And I, I also wanted to see, you know, can you indigenize a game that already exists? Like, can you, can you do that? So I ROM hacked the original Super Mario Brothers and I replaced all the language, the English with Abenaki. So it's whole Baas where it should say world, it's turtle because it's Turtle Island. Uh, Losa instead of time means hurry, one player, two player. Sipsy is my last name where it would say Mario. Um, my pixel art skills are limited though, so no judging. Um, the Mario is now Guscabe, who's a prominent Abenaki figure in our, our stories. Um, and a lot of times in our stories, his foil is Malsum the wolf. So instead of Goombas, I turn them into wolf prints. So it's like he's tracking. And when you jump on them, they don't squish and die. They just cartwheel off the screen in a cute way. I changed the sprite animation. And the one-up mushrooms are now acorns, which are a staple food item in, for Abenaki peoples. So you can do a lot to change a game as kind of iconic as Mario into something of your own by changing mechanical language and the visual language. Um, and then I've made kind of my own original games. This is one small step. Um, it's a space walking simulator. And this game is meant to kind of visually um, invoke ideas about like, oh, an open world game, an exploration game, a sandbox game. But the mechanics really subvert that narrative. Um, as you play, you kind of quickly realize there's nothing for you to collect. There is nothing for you to fight. And your experience in spaces is not free and it is not unaccounted for. So as you play, you start to realize that you're changing the spaces you are in just by being in them. And eventually it gets to the point where you've changed so much that also like space is the final frontier. I liked to, you know, thought I was being cute about that. Um, so eventually you get to the point where the game says colonization complete and it just quits itself because you've changed the game so much that there's, you can't go back. It's not the same anymore. 
Um, and this is full of birds, which I made with um, Yakichuchi Chumash artist, Sarah Bascaradilli, whose work is incredible and everyone should check it out. Um, it's basically a 3D art gallery, a 3D gallery for her. So it starts kind of a la uh, Mario 64 in a, a gallery that just has her images on the walls and you can go through them into a level that is derived from the images, the landscapes, the soundscapes, the animals, the plants that inspired her to create that particular piece. And there are bits and pieces of the piece itself scattered throughout that level. So it's this kind of interactive, explorative space that kind of explores what it means to be in a space, how we as Indigenous women artists choose to maintain and recreate or bend and reshape spaces and places. Um, and it also kind of um, pushes the boundaries of how Indigenous peoples have existed in the space of the gallery historically. Um, and that is what I have for you. Uh, Uliuni, thank you so much. I'm just, um, one second. Thank you very much um, for that talk, um, Dr. Bird. Um, I know I have some notes and ideas. Um, we're gonna open up the chat. If you, if you have a question um, and you, you'd like to, to ask, uh, you can post it in the chat. Um, you could do it uh, a direct message if you don't want your name, um, or you can just post it in there. Or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and we'll, we'll take questions um, in the order that you, uh, at, in the order that they come. Um, Sean, do you, do you want to start with anything or do you have any comments to, to get it going? I was busily putting- Okay into the chat so i, I will say this <laughs> to, to start i mean there's a lot of things yes. i mean i mean this idea of preventive coding um uh is 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 really interesting i think a lot of times obviously when people play games they don't think about that and think about what's behind the game we talk about some of this in my 306 class um but it was it was interesting when you mentioned the idea of the horses and i know you you had that that separate piece on historical games network about girls and horses which was great um, but the naming of the horses like i i never worried about my horses names but um, for another project um, where i'm essentially a, a voyeur a photographer i take a lot of photos in the game and when you download the photos the same thing happens that um when it, you 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 can choose to rename the photos but mm -hmm. even when i have downloaded the photos and they have the name of the place and it 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 will tag it as problematic um, the Cumberland region, it won't save that name. Um, and I wonder if the same thing applies, if, if the same sort of filters apply with the photographs um, as with the horse. So if I went in there and used some derogatory term for indigenous culture, right, if it would be okay, but all of a sudden if I used Roxy, it, it wouldn't, right? Yeah. Or Cumberland, it's not. Um, so I, you know, in one way is it across the entire game, there's that sort of perversion of an inverting what is okay to say um when you name something that's um yeah that 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 sparked um some ideas there yeah it's interesting how they kind of outline the morality that players are supposed to abide by but then they do all kinds of problematic stuff themselves yeah um it it also reminded me and it's in the it, and I, I, I this happened to sean but you know with with the Wikipedia where you're not supposed to harm them, but then people subvert that as as people do in these online games. And um, I remember with Sean there's a story where he he didn't have control of his controller and he accidentally shot a Civil War veteran. Um, and that was totally oh, yeah. fine. And, and that was totally fine, <laughs> right? You know, because it was just another just you're, another you're, npc you're, and just another npc that i'm supposed to go do something for anyway and so i can either hand him some money which is what i was trying to do um <laughs> and i got off my horse hit the wrong button on the controller and ended up pulling my weapon on him and shooting him um <laughs> yeah the hello and the i'm pointing my gun button at you in red dead are way too close, too close. they yeah. are way too close yeah i um and and some of these games um um like never alone um 
I've showed parts of some of these games in my classes, but I think there's the real stark difference that you point to um, when a game is influenced, not influenced, where uh, indigenous people take part closely in the creation of a game versus um, um, uh, coders using sort of, you know, uh, uh, cultural markers or signifiers that they just kind of randomly place. And, and I remember when this is my land was coming out and I, I was contacting them for other, uh, re, uh, other questions about the game. Mm -hmm. and, and I sent them a series of questions that dealt a little bit with the, the American West and with uh, the indigenous in the game. And the response for the indigenous was um, essentially, well, they're just, we, we, we've collapsed everybody mm -hmm. uh, together. And so this is just like a, um, a telescope Native American character. We brought them all together with all their best features. I have the reply somewhere. And I was, yeah. it was exactly what you were speaking to, right? They just, this is what fits for them. This is what mm -hmm. works for them. And um, um, yeah, they were actually uh, Ukrainian yes. Um, developers. Yes, yeah. Yeah, they also told me that they didn't have enough money to hire an indigenous uh, person to consult on the game, which is not true. And also so many, like you should absolutely pay indigenous people, queer people, women, people of color for their labor. But I know myself and a ton of other indigenous peoples like would have consulted to make the game good. You know what I mean? Um, and they, they, but they just weren't interested. That's the point is like, they, it's not that they didn't have the money. They, they weren't interested in having that um, be a part of their, their game. Because it's easier for them, I think, as you mentioned uh, with Anna Anthropy, that idea of a feedback loop, right? Both them already having played games and being comfortable with making those games, and but using the same myth markers, signifiers that they that that they also think you know players want because that's what they wanted. Um, mm -hmm. Or you know your example of Connor, you know the tree example is so classic of that, and and of the the case of of. Um, the indigenous person in uh, RDR2, you know, I remember the beginning of the game and he's teaching Arthur how to hunt and he can find the trails. And I'm just like, what? Like, really, you're going that quick, that soon to- um, Right away. <laughs> right away um, um, yeah. to the, those, those markers, yeah. And I mean, they know that those are the stereotypical markers of Indianness. Like these yeah. are the images that have been peddled throughout history and photography and art and film and television right. and all these literature, all these types of things. And companies like um, Techland, which is a Polish company and they make the Call of Juarez games. They oh, yeah, do this yeah. kind of stuff too in Bound in Blood, um, <laughs> which is just so bad. Just oh, save yeah. yourself from ever playing that game. Oh no, I've played it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone here who hasn't, it's bad in all the ways. I had no play. redeeming qualities. <laughs> um, so it, in that game, you're at one point, you're in a Navajo encampment and oh. there's just totem poles everywhere. Yes. A five second Google search would tell you that Navajo people do not make totem poles, right. but they know that that is a traditional marker of Indianness, and their players yeah. will be able to recognize it. And that's why they put it in the game. Yeah. Yeah, it's um there there is a number of circumstances in that game where that those those things sort of come up. Um, um yeah, that and that, I forgot about that one, but that is a a, a clear one. They are they are really those those get Call of War is I think follows in in different ways along Red Dead and using you know the whole Western thing games are are built upon those same sort of tropes um, and use those markers a lot. Um, but that's what I think I, what I was referencing before, make Never Alone and other games like it so important um, um, because you have that investment, you have that um, um, connection to, to that creation of, of that experience, right? Um, and it's so funny to think that they don't want to pay anybody um, to be part of that process, right? Yeah. And and I think some of what that really comes down to is, you know, kind of what I preach with my students is that video game companies are incredibly risk averse because it is an industry. It is late stage capitalism. They are make the, the budget for Red Dead Redemption 2 from start to finish marketing everything was $540 million. Yeah. The highest grossing film of all time, Avatar, 
earned $2.8 billion. So like a quarter of what that movie has made is what it costs to make this game. So they don't want to do things that they think are going to be unpopular. Their um, dedication is to the financial success of the game. Whereas indigenous creators, their dedication is to their community and getting it yep. right. They don't want to release, they would much rather make something that tanks than make something that right. their community is ashamed of. Yeah. And is I harmful to them. You, I mean, and that you see that separation in film too, but I think as you mentioned with the budget, those, those are a bit different. We have a question in the chat. It says, do you think a lot more Native American games need to come out before the typical brutal narrative changes? I think so. And I think it's not even just Native American games. I think it's um, diverse communities of players and developers who are interested in, interested in doing something different with games. So one of my favorite things Anna Anthropy says in her, her book, um, Rise of the Video Game Zinester, when she talks about the feedback loop is she talks about the fact that there is so much mechanically that is possible to do in games that we've just not done because they are these cookie cutter reproductions of themselves because we know that is what makes money. There are so many things you could do with games design wise that people just don't do. So even something like Portal, which replicates all the kind of the mechanics of a first person shooter and is not a first person shooter. <laughs> it's not violent. You don't shooting anything in that game. Even design like that, where you're just utilizing mechanics in a different way to tell a different kind of story, which is, again, a lot of what indigenous designers do is using mechanics differently. Um, that kind of development across the board, I think, is what needs to happen and what needs to become popularized for these, mm -hmm. for the industry to break out of this type of, we just make Call of Duty every four years. Not crapping on Call of Duty, I'm just saying it is one of those games that like, it's kind of the same thing over and over again. They just reskin it and yeah. you know update the graphics and stuff. So I think it, that's what needs to happen. It, the, 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 they're very iterative of each yeah. other, right? Um, and you don't see those in those game spaces. I, um, the, the game that you showed where River were trails, which is a great game and, and La Pense was involved in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> there's, um, but there's that functional difference between the AAA and the independent. Mm -hmm. And um, I do think to, uh, there's more questions here, but I do think to that question too, and I think you kind of touched on this, maybe you touch on it more, is with individuals and scholars and indigenous people bringing up these issues of representation, that there has been some note mm -hmm. there um, and some change. It hasn't moved the needle that far, right? but I, you know, I think the idea is to keep pressing and to keep pushing and to, and, and as you mentioned, to keep, to get the community of developers more diverse itself, like mm -hmm. with, with most things. Yeah, yeah, to have more diverse people making games, more diverse people consuming games, more diverse games being made. Yeah, it's, it's about slowly moving the need needle. It's never gonna happen overnight. It just has to kind of happen through through exposure to different types of development and through different people being given access to the industry, absolutely. And that Rockstar was willing at some level to recognize, I mean, I, and I'm not patting anybody on the back for just recognition, but the fact that you take a half million dollar game and put Billion. into it, build into it a certain sensitivity, um, right? That yeah. it, it suggests that there's at least an openness and a willingness to, to start moving the needle a little bit more than say Red Dead 1 or um, the game that preceded Red Dead, which was just that kind of violent. Red Dead know, Revolver. Yeah, Red Revolver, Dead. exactly, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think I always tell my students like, it's perfectly okay and encouraged to have complicated relationships with objects. Um, I just drag Red Dead Redemption through the mud so much. I love that game. I yeah. love it. I think it's amazing. Like there's so many things about it that are absolutely incredible. And there are so many things about it where I'm like, yeah, guys just missed it so much. Um, so it's okay to have complicated relationships with things. We should, and we should be able to criticize the things that we love because we love them and we want them to be better. Um, not because we're trying to tear them down. I think that's the like kind of lens we need to have on that type of stuff. Like 
the the depiction of the Wapiti and their relationship with the United States military, like that storyline was really good. And it, you know, it was, there's one mission you go on where the military is actively denying these people vaccines. And so you go and get the vaccines on their behalf because if they're caught doing it, that's just license for the government to kill them all, you know? And so there was some research done there that now I was like, okay, you did put this storyline in this huge big budget game where most people would never be exposed to that kind of narrative if they hadn't put it in there. So they made, they made steps. They just, you know, they dipped their toe in. They didn't dive in. I, and I, I think the point is I, I often tell my students in 306 or 307 that the gaming class is that um, a game can be fun, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and it can have problems. Oh yeah. Um, and that's okay, right? But it's, it's how we think about those things and how we, we, we talk about those things and investigate mm-hmm. them, which leads to another question here. Um, and I'll kind of preface this um, with take our classes. Um, uh, there are there any books you can recommend for learning how to decolonize established narratives? Yeah. So um, from a game design perspective, Anna Anthropy's book, I think everybody who's interested in game design should read Rise of the Video Game Zinesters. It's short. It's profound. It's super accessible. It's wonderful. Um, from kind of a decolonial indigenous studies perspective, um, Linda T. Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies is a fantastic piece. She's a Maori scholar. Um, the whole book is wonderful, and there's this wonderful section, chapter eight, called 25 Indigenous Projects, which outlines 25 specific kind of decolonial acts that Indigenous people can engage in, or people can engage in, that are like actionable, tangible things, what they mean and what they provide. Um, Philip Deloria's book, Indians in Unexpected Places, um, really questions this kind of historical image of the Native American and opens up with this discussion about the expected versus the unexpected and ideas of anomaly and why are indigenous people seen as an anomaly in a lot of spaces. And when you say something is anomalous, you are therefore implying the thing that it is against is correct and normal. And so he provides this discussion, which I think is really important. Um, And the work work of Michelle Rahasia, um, she has several pieces. She has a book called Reservation Realism, which is about film. if you wanted kind of a shorter access to that, um, there's an article called Reading Nanook's Smile. Um, and she introduces this concept of visual sovereignty and how indigenous filmmakers specifically, but you can absolutely apply this logic to game design um, or any other medium really for that matter, um, how they're acknowledging, utilizing and deconstructing a lot of the methods of traditional cinema in order to reclaim and re- change indigenous representation and also have it in some ways appeal to a broader audience. Um, so it's, it's a really wonderful piece. So those, those works are, I think, a really good starting point for that kind of stuff. Those are great resources. And um, Sean has been putting some of those in the chat mm-hmm. if, if you want to look at those. And I think when we do post this, we'll post um, a list of those sure, yeah. um, for people to look at. I think that would be really great for 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 interested um, and parties, we'll take them from here. But yeah, you can, if they're right in the chat there, they're also really good question to yeah, help other, think about these spaces. One of the other things to remember too, is we're talking about video games, but there's a, these kinds of representations show up in other forms of games too, especially in board games mm-hmm. um, where Native Americans tend to be rather portrayed as active agents in the game. They tend to be resources for mm-hmm colonial populations to manage um, and to move about. And we've had, we have weekly game nights with our students, um, unfortunately been on Zoom for the last two years, but um, (laughs) when we sat and played, we'll we'll play um, kind of war sims like 1775, which is a revolutionary game, Um, or uh, there's a a Cora Discovery game, a Lewis and Clark Cora Discovery game. And in both of those cases, the representation of native people are some ch- just little pawns or little chits on on the board that are being moved around by the player and that you know the lack of agency there is obvious but the language of play 
that mm-hmm. happens it, as mm-hmm. we're playing the game. And I'm not faulting the students for, for doing this, but it, it becomes very possessive, this notion of my Indians, mm-hmm. moving them off my land, moving them, right? And, and placing them in play, where, ways that are advantageous to the, to the player um, character. Um, so this, it's there, I just want to kind of make certain that people are aware that these kinds of we can read these kinds of um, problems into a variety of media and especially into a variety of spaces where we're playing at mm-hmm. um, in, in, in these kind of environments. Yeah, it, absolutely. It really, it really speaks to I mean, that's a great point um, that the it's it's very easy when you play these games to get lost in the game and then the representations become normalized, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we don't have a, an open eye thinking about these things, then um, then they just become resources. They be, just become the trope. They just become that and we get used to that and um, that being inured to uh, you know, racialized representations is, is problematic in, in across these things. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the class, I'm, I'm teaching class right now called Decolonizing Gaming. Um, and so we do a lot of, you know, basic game studies stuff um, at the beginning to talk about, you know, ideas of like the magic circle and rules versus mechanics. And what does it actually <laughs> even mean to play a game? Like, what is that? Um, and then we, one of the first things we read is Ed Chang's piece on close playing, which I think anybody who's interested in games and kind of really critically examining them, that piece is very short but it really gives you the tools to kind of go in. And I, and I think it kind of primes my students for this type of discussion of like, go into a game and don't play it the way that you would normally play. Try to find out something that it won't let you do. And why won't it let you do that? And just go from there. Just like do your best to try to play it incorrectly. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I think that that can really kind of show you a lot about what's happening and, and, and what's at stake in, in this basic games. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. It's kind of like looking for the absence in something, right? You're, you're poking those sort of boundaries. Um, I, I've been doing that in Red Dead RDR2. Um, I've divorced the narrative. I don't play the narrative. Once I get out of the initial mode, I'm just, it's an open world. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't break the world and you, you, you can't break the narrative, but you can find those spaces where there's other things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's I, that's a really good point, and that's a really good reference there. Thank you for for mentioning that. The recording will be posted um, later. Yes, we'll I don't know maybe clean it up or just get it posted. And and I think like I said, we'll post um, a link also to the the books um, that we've been um, that we've been talking about in case anybody has readings. But also seriously, I, I didn't mean. Uh, there a lot of universities have classes on on uh, looking at games and and we have we have two classes on technology and games um well three really and so if you're interested in that um always feel free to contact professor smith or myself another question here um who do you think is to blame for these ongoing tropes in video games would it be the studios producing them or the consumers buying them or neither or would this all be classified as, quote, what came first, the chicken or the egg type of question? So I think um, when, I think studios are responsible for perpetuating them. They're not responsible for originating them. These types of tropes have been picked up from photography, cinema, television, um, and just planted in this digital space of games. Um, they're responsible for perpetuating them because they know that their users are not gonna question it. Or the majority of their users are not gonna question it or speak out against it and it's gonna make them money. So they do should be held accountable for that. I don't think users or consumers are necessarily responsible, but I think when you now know something like this, like you do have the power to vote with your dollar. I mean, look what happened with the third Fantastic Beast movie. It was like the lowest opening day of any Harry Potter movie ever because like people are sick of her shit and they were like we're not going to go see this movie um 
if you are, if you know something, like you can speak out against it. You can choose not to buy it. You can choose to be an ally and raise your voice again alongside, you know, indigenous peoples who are speaking out against something like this land is my land and saying like, this isn't okay. And they're getting kicked off the servers. But if everybody on the server is saying that, or if hundreds of people on the server are saying that, it's a lot harder to manage that type of conversation. So, so I think, um, it's our responsibility to be conscientious consumers and to try to educate ourselves to the best of our abilities about what it is we're engaging with. And like I said, like having these critical relationships with the things that we're, we're playing with um, to, to kind of know what they're doing and who it's for and why and that kind of stuff, because they're not just, I mean, games are powerful cultural objects and they, the hegemony of games, like a lot of ideas about, um, you know, culture and, and race and gender and violence and sexuality and whatever, they all get replicated within the space of games. They don't, the magic circle is not real. They do not exist in a world in and of themselves. They are incredibly permeable things. So. It, it, yeah, that's a great point. I would, I would add to that and say, particularly in, for indigenous peoples, um, it, when thinking about these things is, is as you mentioned with that book, there's resources there to think about what you can do elsewhere to become educated and being educated then leads to different choices. And, mm -hmm. and I would even say here at Cal State Long Beach, um, think about um, our local uh, indigenous peoples mm -hmm. um, and, and Pavunga, which is located on campus and where that is um, politically and socially in this um, it, it currently, um, and there, there's a lot of discourse going on about, you know, land preservation and, and a lot of people on campus and students don't know about the fight over that little piece of land on Cal State Long Beach of Pavanga um, that is a, a, a Tongva land and, and where that is. And so sometimes being current with where we're at also helps us associate with the things we do, which is play games in this instance. Yeah. And once um, again, encourage ahead, people Sean. to take classes in American Indian studies mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in our history department as well, um, where these issues are raised and where you can avail yourself of the tools to think critically about the media that you're consuming. Um, so, yeah, Sean put in a, a Dr. Bird's Twitter handle in the chat and also our um, Twitter handle. Um, we're less we're not so as good at as it as it we should be. There's gonna be trash talking John Wayne and Custer and fine. <laughs> that was that was beautiful. It, it, made, it made me feel good. Uh, <laughs> I knew we I knew we invited the right person. <laughs> um, yeah, any final thoughts or questions that we have for Dr. Bird today or uh, in general about uh, games? Uh, game development or indigenous uh, people in games. And if you have a question and don't want to ask it or think of something later, you're always welcome to reach out to me at my Twitter or email or whatever. I'm always happy to chat with folks who are interested in this stuff because it's what I'm interested in too. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I, 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 I hope some students will, will take you up on that. Um, I know we usually have, um, in my own class, we have students, they make a twine game, um, mm. historical twine game, um, so thinking about how we represent a variety of characters is really important, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what stories we're telling. I guess that's what it always, for me often, is what stories are we telling in those games um, and, and, and how we're uh, representing a broad range of people. Um, yeah, so that, that would, that's a great resource for, for everyone out there to, to, to have people to talk to about these things. Thank you. Final thoughts, ideas? Anybody else want to ask a question? Well then. We're just about on time. We are. We usually do. Um, so. Um, <laughs> oh, there is one more. There hey, one more Davis. Question. <laughs> oh, con congrats and uh, you're gonna have a great time and say hi to Professor Sinajani for me. That was my advisor. <laughs> there you go. That's terrific. <laughs> Yep. Nice. Yes. Cool. Oh, right. Another oh, a hand. Jasmine. Go ahead and open your microphone, Jasmine, if you'd like. And Hi, 
I just wanted to thank you for coming to our school and uh, giving us uh, this presentation. It was really insightful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to the talk. It was, <laughs> it was so fun to be here with you all. Great. Any other final thoughts? I don't want to leave anybody um, with anything. All right, I'm going to stop the recording then. Um, and again, I will we'll post this we on our YouTube channel, maybe on our website, not sure, um, with all the, the, the resources. It'll be on Twitter as well. Twitter's and as well. yeah, 100 other places. No, not 100 other <laughs> places generally. Uh, um, and we'll also have a list of those resources attached either uh, to both the video and we'll put it up on the website as well. So great. Yep. Awesome. All right.